Bedford. Welcome to this edition of Heads Up. I'm your host, Sue Mullen, retired school counselor. And with me is my co-host, licensed family therapist, Diane Vaccarello. Diane, always good to see you. Always great to see you, Sue. And I'm super happy to be back again for another show with you. Well, the feeling is mutual. Uh, I had a funny moment. Yes. I was getting ready and running around the house because, of course, that's all we do now, right? Is right. Stay home. And uh, I had this thought about how many people actually appear on camera, but when they stand up, they're in their pajama bottoms or sweatpants, <laughs> or uh, I'm not going to make you stand up. Okay. But I do want you to know that I had the thought before I came into this. Fully uh, dressed. <laughs> okay, there you go. There you go. Uh, hey, it's good to be back because I feel like when we ended our last conversation, we sort of put a teaser out there to people that we were going to turn the tide from talking about kids to talking about adults this week. Exactly. Yeah, and uh, given the fact that it is uh, still winter, and still winter, winter, winter and I'm, wor winter. I'm working hard to make it look like summer over here, Sue. <laughs> well, I, I thought about that too. I thought, you know, should I dress lighter? But the, but then the, that wasn't going to work either. But uh, so um, yeah, so I thought maybe this week we would turn the tables towards adults and talk a little bit about what you're seeing in your family practice that you have right here in Bedford, New Hampshire, uh, as it relates to maybe the winter doldrums, the anxiety and depression that comes with cold and dark and yeah. COVID. Yes. So <laughs> tell me what, tell me what it's like. So it's good that we're talking about adults and also how they obviously impact kids. So we spoke about kids last week, adults this week. Obviously, we all affect one another. So in terms of anxiety and depression, we talked in the first show about how there's been COVID-related impact to anxiety increases as it first came up. Then sort of like depression started to hit even more so. Those who already had pre-existing issues with anxiety and depression, I would say with depression, it made it far worse. And with anxiety, for some people, they actually felt like, hey, I've been sort of in training for this. So they felt a little bit prepared. Right. So that's the difference uh, for the anxiety and depression piece. With season um, being winter, we have another layer for those who are dealing with seasonal affective disorder. And that is the less light, it's shorter days, being cooped up or stuck more at home, which we already have been, you know, but at least uh, during the summer, people were getting out a little bit more outside, maybe doing a hike. Oh, walking. definitely. Got a lot of people out, right, riding bikes, and it was fantastic to see that. But a lot less of that, obviously, going on now. I know myself that uh, I, I, I have been aware in a way that I'm usually not. Mm hmm just how cooped up I have felt, not yeah. being able to do much, uh, primarily because it got cold. As you said, when it, when it was warm and it was, and it was mild right through December, yeah. at least we were able to walk, we could get outside, you could see a neighbor on the street. Yeah. But um, I found out this winter that I do have an off button and it mm -hmm. is about 35 degrees. When it starts getting colder than 35 degrees, I don't want to walk. Yeah. And yeah. Um, it's a problem because there's nowhere inside to go that I feel is safe enough, adequately ventilated enough. Mm -hmm. So what what's a girl to do? I guess exactly. that's my question of the therapist. Exactly. So the, the idea of um, having movement psychologically is helpful for us, which is why with depression and even anxiety, it's recommended that we focus on things that probably a lot of our viewers are already aware of, like um, exercising daily can help people just have it creating that movement. And psychologically, it helps with not feeling quite as stuck when we have physical movement, as well as um, 
you know, the idea of eating healthy, not limiting intake of alcohol, things like that. Uh, But when people are stuck inside, it's a lot easier accessibility. It's about that, right? If it's right there. Literally, we were just talking about the newspaper coverage of the 25% increase in alcohol sales. In our state. Uh, Yes. Yeah. And so that's contributing to, if you think it's a suppressant, so that's also contributing in a sense to, it's all about the layers, right? And one layer after another, after another. So as a suppressant that affects depression, it changes people's sleep cycles, which also affects mood and all sorts of things kind of start to be impacted as a result of that. Even people's tolerance level when they don't have quite as much sleep. So you can see how there's like a snowball effect to these kinds of things. And just the consistency and regularity um, of our day-to-day routines. For some people, they're sort of like, I've never been so consistent and routinized. Uh, And for some, they're like, that is that Groundhog Day impact that really is grinding on the nerves. It's interesting too, because I think, you know, we forget sometimes that coping strategies are coping strategies. I mean, people are doing things because they're trying to manage their feelings. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those coping strategies help a situation. Sometimes in the short term, you may think a coping strategy is helping a situation like maybe the second martini. Exactly. But in the long run, um, people have to start being able to see what really helps and what is just a band-aid basically. Right. Right. And which things have diminishing returns attached to them. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think, again, going back to your comment about mood, when these things are affecting our mood and then we internalize those kinds of things, or we have these belief systems that we make up about um, how we feel is who we are. You know, we have to really have a distinctive difference or separation between the cognitions that we're having or belief systems about ourselves um, and what's actually happening. So some people are finding them themselves saying, oh, my house is messy. I must be a lazy person. Not necessarily true. Okay. I am, I am holding, this is like, um, you know, when the mind reader holds up, (laughs) this is, this is my outline for today's episode. And here's what I have written down. I want to hear just because you feel it doesn't mean it's real. That is Very true. That was a thought that as I was kind of wandering around this afternoon, getting myself in the mindset to uh, have this conversation with you, Mm -hmm. I thought, wow, how long did it take me to learn Mm. that just because I was experiencing something at a 10 Mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mean that you would experience it at a 10 that I would experience it at a 10 if I had enough exercise or sleep. Uh, It took me a long time to realize that you can feel something. Mm -hmm. And though, you know, and before anybody accuses me of denying feelings and and whatever, what I mean by that obviously is that the feeling starts from a real place, Mm -hmm. but the volume behind your response behind whether or not you've got coping strategies that work for you right really can impact how it affects you and the people around you exactly right i mean i can't say it better than that there are two aspects to um our feelings, if you will, it's that there, people can get triggered by thoughts, cognitions, or physical sensations even, mm-hmm. right? So we have to be able to sort of tease apart all these different layers and the physical triggering can come in the form of just realizing that we're like clenching our body and we're not even realizing it. So right. if you see my shoulders, up, sometimes people can hold their shoulders up here and they need to be dropped down here, right? Mm-hmm. There are certain physiological signals that get sent to our brain that trigger off that amygdala part, which is that fight, flight, or freeze. And that tells us there's something wrong. We need to kind of prepare ourselves, gear up. That's kind of that anxiety type of frenetic energy that can impact us without us even realizing. So softening our stomach, dropping the shoulders, relaxing the so many muscles in the face 
I mean, really so many, if you just practice like softening around the eyes and the jaw area, Mm -hmm. it's really practicing the breath. So many times people, you know, say, oh, you sound like a therapist with the breathing thing. And yeah, well, one, I am a therapist too. Um, The breathing is really important because it's remarkable. Really is remarkable how many times I might meet with someone. And especially when I'm doing EMDR, which is a, um, It's a a form of treatment around trauma and phobias Mm -hmm. and people are trying to be very attentive. They want it to work, you know, so they're kind of like leaning into that, but maybe a little bit anxious and I'll notice that they're holding their breath and I'll literally have to say, take a breath. It literally take a breath. You know, it's an autonomic thing, but when we're, I I imagine for some people, it must literally be life-changing for you to point out something like that to them and to just counsel them to stop in their tracks for a minute when they're feeling all geared up and just ask themselves how they feel and where they are. Exactly. Which is exactly the right point that we need to slow down and we need to ground ourselves in physically sometimes where we are. And so that means um, sort of balancing our posture if we're sitting down or, or regulating how we're standing. Uh, again, all of these signals send messages to the brain. It's like a cueing that sends a message. And most of the time, the message does not mean that we're in a panic situation or a crisis situation, but it's looping and it doesn't help the cognitions that come after, which are, you know, all sorts of things. We are with ourselves all day long, especially during quarantine, especially during this COVID times and 90% of the conversation on a pre-COVID time Mm -hmm. is with ourselves. So since COVID, it's probably, I don't, I'm just guessing like 99%. 99%, right. Because some people aren't even interacting. You know, they have very limited interactions with other humans. Sometimes I'm hearing people say that the time that they were able to have a conversation, which might be, hi, thank you for my cup of coffee through the Starbucks window, you know, or not yeah. even. And of course, there are people who are um, in connection with other you know, family members throughout the day, sometimes way more than they've ever had before. And so that's an area of comfort or an area of distress because, you know, um, they haven't necessarily had that preparation or warning that this was going to happen and and do some work around effective communication skills. So then you're looking at anxiety and things like that. Let me ask you, let me ask you um, uh, sort of a entry level related question. How many people do you think actually know when they're anxious or depressed? I mean, do you think that most people know when they're feeling anxious or depressed or is it something that you have to arrive at? How how does it work? Some people are much more tuned into what that symptom looks like for them in the symptomology. It really isn't across the board the same for everyone, but there's obviously general trends that we can talk about. I think the more aware somebody is acutely, the more they can address, obviously, those um, pieces physiologically and cognitively. And Mm -hmm. so there are fewer people than not when they first are sort of like, they'll, they'll say, I think I might have anxiety or I, you know, I was told I should come in here and talk to you, but I'm not really sure what I have. And, um, you know, some people are like, I full on know I've been sort of anxious for decades and I I'm ready to do something with that. Um, so it, it varies. I think fewer people are aware, um, And with depression, it's interesting because you can kind of get sucked into this almost like a void of it. You're not even realizing what you don't realize until you're out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I had one person say, you know, after sort of like really making some headway with it, she's like, I can't believe this is how people were seeing the world. And that's not the lens I was looking through whatsoever. And it's so different. And so I do want to say that with talking about depression, and anxiety with kids or adults, but with adults, we have to also be really considerate and um, reasonable when we're talking about the idea that uh, sometimes you'll see like magazines talk about, again, all these eating well, sleeping well, saying do X, Y, and Z, and basically 
you'll you should be better. feeling better. Yeah. yeah. But that's not exactly, um, these things can help us absolutely and do help. Um, we also have to keep in mind there can be a biological or physiological component. Serotonin levels in the brain right. um, can be really low with someone who has depression and can be um, you know, if they're really, really high can lead to sort of like some up sort of behaviors. And so at a biological level, we have to also be aware that we can't gaslight ourselves or other people into thinking, well, right. you're just not, you know, cause they'll try certain things and then not even feel like they're successful, which just feeds that, um, conversation with themselves that they're not even good at anything. They're not oh, even good at that. Right. And the judgment piece. Is exactly. Huge, right? You're yeah. going to hear me. Uh, I'm telling you, we don't actually have a number of episodes that we're doing. So we're yeah. probably going to do 12,000 of them between <laughs> now. and. Uh, but you'll hear me use the word judgment over yeah. and over and over again, because I think it's hugely impactful. It really is. Even when we just talk about the labels of anxiety and depression, yeah. My own experience working with, um, you know, sort of uh, older kids and young adults was almost that um, anxiety was okay because mm -hmm. you could attach stress to anxiety yeah. and, and sort of say, oh, you know, well, of course you're anxious, you poor thing. Look at the number of stressors that you have on you. Mm -hmm. But then the flip side of that anxiety, uh, the depressive piece, um, I heard a lot of people talking about that mm -hmm. in terms of being a failure, being a weak, having weaknesses, uh, not looking at it as just not having enough in their toolbox of coping strategies, but really that there's a character flaw around the depression. And I think it comes as, as a huge relief sometimes to realize that there can be a metabolic base to it. Exactly you know, right. That, that biology is at work here in addition to yeah. just uh, whether or not you're you know, uh, adequately prepared to cope with something. Absolutely right. That, which is why it's important for people to go to their doctor, primary care, have blood levels checked, things like that on a um, you know annual or more basis because there is a connection to that. The judgment piece, uh, you're completely spot on with that. There was a time earlier on where, where again, I'm constantly trying to figure out how can we reach more people because the needs of one person at a time, it's just not enough hours in a day. Mm -hmm. So we were putting together these groups people would be signing up, like you'd open it up and they'd sign up for an anxiety group. It'd be full right away. You post a depression group. And honestly, uh, the, the image of the two things was not that far off, but the word depression, the word anxiety, right, right. crickets, because the stigma is so strong. People did not want to sign up for a group about depression, but for anxiety, there was more permission around that. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. The stigma, and, and honestly, they're, they're sort we've mentioned before, they're like cousins or sisters that, you know, the two can go hand in hand to a degree. So some of the treatment, it's not exactly the same, but you know, there are definitely aspects of self-care that go into um, both. And you can, um, when you're treating some of the uh, depression symptoms that can help anxiety and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to mention, there's a couple of things um and I sort of like were, was, you know, one of the things I like about this time with you is that I don't know what questions you're going to ask. I just kind of show up. I love not knowing. It's something that works for me really well um, because I used to, there was a time in life where I learned that there can be too much preparation. Like you can over prepare sometimes like, um, and I like not knowing because it gives me the chance to actually just use my brain and think and figure out. I, I know what I know and I just want to be able to like put that out there and not have it be so organized. But one of the things when I knew we were talking about adults with anxiety and depression, I was trying to think of sort of topics that really connect to how, what, what things we need to tend to. Yeah. Um, and I sort of loosely came up with four different um, thoughts about I, and they happen to all start with the letter R, which I thought was really interesting. So I'm going to call them the four okay. R's. Are you ready? Okay. On yeah. your mark, 
Get set, go. So number one, yep. we have to refuel. It's a really important thing when we're um, combating depression, especially over COVID times, we have to prepare for like a marathon, not a sprint sort of mindset. Yep. We really do have to recognize that, yes, the the idea of vaccines coming in, that's that's great. You know, hopefully things opening up, but there's anxiety that comes along with that for re-entry for people. How is that going to look for both teens and adults? Um, we're in it for the long haul. We're in it for the long haul of life. So we need to really uh, be mindful about the idea of uh, refueling and um, really relaxing as well into what works for us. Um, is not that one of the R's? So re refuel. Okay. No, oh. actually that should be five hours. I stand corrected. <laughs> We're going to have five. So, um, so it's refueling and relaxing because I don't know if, you know, we'll get into this too much today. I know we have, you know, some thoughts about other topics, but basically there are people who are introverted and extroverted. You've I'm sure heard of that and know about that. Some people think that introverted people are shy um, and that extroverted people are social. Th those aren't really the continuums that we're talking about. If you think of like your phone battery growing low, mm -hmm. um, the way I think about introversion and extroversion is that when your battery is low, meaning yourself, yep. In order to um, recharge your battery, you need to do certain things. And for an introverted person, um, more solo activities or um, maybe reading a book, I, I knit. Um, there's lots of different things that people can do. I'm definitely an introverted person, uh, but I'm outgoing. And so you can have an introverted, outgoing person, um, or you can have an extroverted, shy person. It's very I think interesting. that comes as a as a shock to a lot of people. It really does. Most people have no idea that I'm like an introverted, but I'm not an introverted person when my battery's charged. That's my point. Once right. I charge my battery up, do like I am very outgoing. I love being around people and doing and being active. Yeah, I think that's part of the introversion extroversion thing, right? So when your battery is low, do you regain your charge by being alone and, and refueling that way? Or are you the kind of person that recharges better when you're in the company of other people? Exactly. I.e. an extrovert. Right. Exactly. So, if yeah. somebody who's extra extroverted, their battery is low, charging their battery is by hanging out and being in a group and, and things like that. So obviously, it, uh, COVID also impacts introverted, extroverted factors right. very differently. Uh, you know, somebody who's used to being around people and having those social activities is what charges their battery. Right. They're struggling um, in a different way. Um, so, and somebody who's introverted, but social, when my battery's charged, I've been doing a lot of battery charging, like, right. but there's no outgoing nowhere to put it yeah right. exactly yeah. so yeah. i just want to mention that when we're refueling we do need to have an awareness of what type we are and kind of like what works for us um right. sometimes on paper a self-care plan or a refueling or recharging plan can look really fantastic but it may not be what does it for us mm -hmm. so we have to really be honest around what authentically genuinely works if you're doing something that's like good for somebody else's better it's just you're working right. hard for not much return right i always say you don't offer a drowning man a drink of water right ah exactly because it's not what he needs he needs not a life preserver needs. right right okay exactly. we have we have about five minutes left okay so here's what i want to know i don't want to rush this yeah what i'm going to say is that um our producer at bctv will be thrilled to know that there will be an adult anxiety and depression part two show Yes. Because right now we're going to talk about the second R, but we're not going to worry about whether or not we get to three or four because there's all next week. Right? That's what I love about this. All right. So what's uh what's what's the second R? So relationships. Oh. We are social people and yeah. we do better and and feel healthier when we have um, connections that are healthy, mm -hmm. right? So it's not about, again, being um, around physically people all the time, but it's feeling connected and having those um, uh, 
uh, relationships that we can count on and that we do feel are positive. It helps us to flourish for sure. Um, We will be able to get through the third one. We can talk about relationships, but I think feel like what we need to really get to is the resiliency one. That's the other R. Okay. It's um, so, but I just don't want to leave relationships off because they're really important for, that's how we flourish when we're in a healthy, whether it's one or 15. So, uh, so when, when you look at the, the aspect of relationship, how is it, how important is it in someone's relationship with somebody else um, to, to be able to either acknowledge their anxiety or depression or to receive the information from somebody else in a way that allows them to continue to talk about it? Uh, how important is that? So it's really important because even though I may work with an individual, I'm constantly thinking about the fact they're part of a system, part of a family or a relationship. We're all affected by one another. And that if that it's important that we learn how to teach people how to treat us, but also our um, relationship to anxiety or our relationship to depression. And so I really do a lot of sort of coaching, encouraging around how to, um, have those conversations with the people that we care about the most and that care about us, because it's really important to have some transparency there Mm -hmm. and um, be able to help uh, explain to a person, oh, that's the, I I like to externalize anxiety. Instead of saying, I am anxious, I have anxiety or anxiety just popped up. You know what I mean? So we can talk about that was anxiety talking, or that was the anxiety that just that thing that you just saw, that was anxiety. It helps us to externalize it and not have it be in relationship with us and that right. other person. Right, right. And, and it's um, what you're provoking thought in me right now, because I'm thinking about that idea of putting the anxiety and depression outside of yourself. Exactly. So that it doesn't become part of you. It yep. is just sort of a, a state that you're in. Um, yeah. And yeah, okay, pretty fascinating. Pretty mm-hmm. fascinating. Okay, next week, okay. we are going to talk about, we're going to continue our conversation with relationships. We're yes. going to talk about resiliency. And yes. I don't even know what the fourth R is. Don't tell me. Okay, it'll be a secret. <laughs> I, I like being able to, right, I like being able to sort of uh, feed off of you as you're, uh, as you're talking about each, each part and piece of your presentation, too. Great. Uh, so a couple of things. One, we have mentioned to each other and to BCTV how important it is to put contact information up at the end of each episode. So if somebody needs immediate assistance with anxiety or depression, there will be a couple of numbers on the screen. Yes. That they can call. And of course, number one is 911 for immediate. There's a number there for NAMI, which is the National Alliance for Mental Illness. And that in New Hampshire has had just very recently extended their hours, meaning, you know, it starts earlier and ends later. So we're including that number as well, because it is something that we in New Hampshire can access. And I'm not sure how many people are aware of that. So, And I want to remind people that they can email BCTV with any suggestions that they have for topics that they would like us to look at as we move forward, uh, post our own ideas. Uh, and I'm kind of excited about that aspect because I yeah. like to, I'd like to know what people are thinking about. Yeah. Okay, so until next week, we have flown through this half hour again. We have. Uh, we'll uh, see you back, same place, same time. And until then, have a great week, Diane. Thanks, Sue, you too. All right, take care. Bye. Bye. So if you feel in love